I want to welcome you. Thank you for joining us for our Wednesday evening service. Uh, again, this is our second week in a row we've had our Wednesday evening service with nobody actually here but you in your homes or wherever you're watching this at. Uh, I think um, it's opened our mind a lot just to be able to know maybe we've taken for granted just the ability to be able to assemble together. Uh, God gave us that, that great, wonderful time of fellowship where we come midweek, we gather together, we're able to sing praise together, we're able to open the Word of God together and have Him speak to us, but then we're able to fellowship together, and that's important for a church body. And I want to say to the church body, I miss you. And uh, I, I know, as I've received calls, we're all missing each other, and, uh, and this is a, a different kind of time for us, but God's using this time. And so I want to invite you to worship together now as we start our service, and uh, join me in prayer as we begin. Father God, I love you, and I praise you, and I thank you for this privilege that you've given us to be able to, to just assemble, even though we're in different places, Lord. We're opening your word together. We're going to sing praise to you together. Lord, open our minds and let us be able to receive what it is that you're trying to tell us. Lord, during this time, we, of course, pray for all those that are going through hardships, and Lord, all those that are suffering, Lord. Lord, for those that are going through a physical suffering, we just pray, God, for that healing. We pray that you would just intervene, and we know that you're the great physician, that you can speak to anything, Lord, and that you can heal it, and we just pray for that physical healing. But God, I pray for the spiritual strength that we all need to be able to, to go through this and to endure, knowing that you promise us you'll never leave us, you'll never forsake us, that you'll walk through anything with us. God, God we need that strength. And Lord, I just pray that you would open our mind to be able to re realize that that strength is there for us to take. God, quieten our fears and Lord, let us be strengthened in the fact of knowing that we have a relationship with you, Lord, that will stand the test of time. Lord, we love you, we praise you, and we just pray your blessings on this service. I pray, God, that you would receive our offering of praise, and Lord, bless us with, with being able to come to wherever we're at, wherever someone is watching this or listening to this, Lord. I just pray, God, that you're able to open their mind and let them be able to hear from you. And Lord, knowing that every message is a conversation, I pray, God, for the response. I pray that hearts are touched and lives are changed. If there's someone listening or watching that has never accepted your son Jesus as Savior, I pray for their salvation. I pray, God, for all of us that maybe have gotten distracted and, Lord, maybe we've gotten away or we're not as close to you as we need to be. Our relationship is, is not complete in the fact that, Lord, we're not giving back to you like you're giving to us. But, Lord, now we realize it. I just pray, God, that you would just call us to repentance. I pray, God, in all these things that... By the end of this service, Lord, that relationships are strengthened, Lord, that lives are changed. We give this service to you, and we just ask that you would bless according to your will. In Jesus' name, amen. The first thing we're going to do is sing a song of praise together. So Brother Barry's going to come and, and uh, lead us, and he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. It comes right out of the Psalms as we sing together. It'll be a new chorus to some of you and some of you not so much new. So let's, let's sing together. He has made me glad. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Simple tune, easy words to remember. As we sing it again, I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad, he has made me glad, I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart, I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made, I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. 
has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. So I had a couple too courses in there too many but you'll forgive me i hope you've learned well we're not going to do that song i'm not going to do that one <laughs> but he will made he has made me glad i pray that in this time of trials and what we're going through that you remember that he has definitely made us glad thanks barry I invite you to get your Bibles and open them to the book of 1 John chapter 4, 1 John chapter 4. If you have your Bible, hold your Bible in the air as you're finding your place before or after you find it and bear record that you have the Word of God. It is your strength. It is the revealed Word of God and we will use it as our authority today. I'm excited about being able to talk to you. I've talked to a lot of people in the past several weeks and so to speak to everybody at one time. Uh, I want to give uh, a message that will speak to all of us as a, as a group, as an assembly. And, um, and first of all, while you're finding your place, I do want to tell you that, um, you know, I could say I miss you and I love you and it would just, uh, it would not ring with the importance that I want it to ring with. But the fellowship that we have here at this body is, um, is something that I think sometimes uh, after you get used to it, you could take for granted. But as soon as it's taken away and we can't have it, it becomes uh, so evident to everyone. I've heard from so many people that say, I just miss gathering together. I miss gathering together. But that's, that's natural. In your, in your uh, Christian life, you need to be able to know the importance of us being able to gather together, the importance of us being able to assemble together because our, spirits feeds, our spirit feeds each other's spirit. And um, in, in the talking to people throughout the past weeks, I've heard... Um, from people's heart. I would call people and, um, and have pretty long conversations based on how they're dealing with what's going on right now and, and knowing this is an untypical time and we're dealing with the coronavirus and the impact of the coronavirus. I want to speak to the church, but I also want to speak to Christians that are listening. You see, there are two different mindsets that I'm seeing and there's a disparage between the mindsets. Uh, I'll be talking to someone and uh, their world has been turned upside down, it's disrupted, and they will have a certain fear about what's going to happen and how this is going to impact them. And, and then you'll see uh, somebody completely on the other side that's saying, well, it's not a concern to me, and uh, I know they have all these different uh, guidelines implemented, but uh, I don't see the importance of it. And, and even in their Christian, in their Christian mindset, knowing that, that they're trusting and believing in God, they're passing another level and they're being able to say, well, even though it's affecting everybody, I know that I'm God's child, so nothing's going to happen to me. And I'm not going to get this thing. And, and, um, and so I want you to understand that even a lot of messages are going out there and, uh, and they're, they're trying to diminish the, the importance or the severity of the, the guidelines that are in place. And, and I'm trying to tell you, we need to respect the guidelines as for safety for others and for godly wisdom. To be able to make decisions that, that, um, that affect other people. And in, in saying this, uh, I know that some people would, would stand in a position and say, well, you know, I'm going to do this and, and I know that, that God's not going to let anything happen to me. And I want to remind you that there's a, there's a fine line between being able to trust God and a certain piety that comes. Or maybe a, a, a spiritual arrogance or a Christian arrogance that we display. And in saying this, I've seen quite a bit of this and, and understand this thing is real that we're facing. Uh, there are people that are sick. There are people that are dying. There are people that are uh, going through terribly, terribly hard times right now. And so uh, I want to give you some perspective if I can. You see, on the one side, you do have people that are, that are just overcome with fear. On the other side, you have people that are viewing this and saying, I'm untouchable. And I want to take you back to a place in Scripture, and I'm not having you turn. I just want to give you the example. You see, sometimes we can get to the point, even as Christians, of thinking that we have such a place and such a will that God is going to, to 
come on to our will and make sure that whatever we're doing and whatever we're thinking is going to work because he's our God that will protect us. But you understand that, that Jesus, even in his temptation, Matthew chapter 4, Luke chapter 4, well, he was tempted by these same temptations that the devil put in front of him. If you remember, Jesus was carried by Satan in the temptation up unto the, the peak of the temple. And Satan said, look down. And he saw how high he was at the peak of the temple. And Satan tempted him. He tested him by saying, cast yourself off of this temple. And if you cast yourself off of this temple, you know that God will send his angels and they'll scoop you up and they'll deliver you because it is written that you shouldn't dash your foot against a stone. The devil was, was intelligent enough to even use the scripture in a way that today I'm even seeing some people use the scripture out of context. But Jesus corrected him. Now this is from Jesus. Jesus turns to Satan and says, Satan, it is written, thou shalt not tempt or test the Lord thy God. Meaning that I have a, a wisdom that tells me that I'm not supposed to cast myself off the top of this temple. Because when I hit the ground, then I would go splat. I'm taking my life into my own hands, and this would be horrible for me. This would be horrible for my physical body. And so I have wisdom enough not to do what I know I need to do, and then just think that God is going to bring himself to my will, and he's going to take care of delivering me. You know, Jesus called this testing God. And so in the same way, I've heard people that have said, well, nothing's going to happen to me. Nothing's going to happen to me. Those same people knowing that if there's a lightning storm outside and their chances of getting struck by lightning are far less than they would be of even getting this. You know, they still choose not to walk outside during the lightning storm because they have a sense of, of reverent fear of saying, I want to use wisdom to protect myself. And so that's what we have to use here. We can't have a, a Christian arrogance that says, because I'm God's child, I can't be hurt by this. We have to have a, a confident fear that says, I'm God's child. I'm going to use the wisdom that he's given me, but I don't have to fear that I'm going to go through something that he won't deliver me from. And so making that point, I want to talk about the other point, fear at this time. And so I want you to understand that during the time that we're going through with this coronavirus and the news that comes daily about the number of people that have it or, or the business that that are closing, that are impacted by this. We can easily begin to process the news and find ourselves living in a state of fear. As I spoke to someone this morning and they were saying, I'm going to stop watching the news because every time I watch the news, my mind gets taken to this place and all of a sudden anxiety comes in. That's, that's natural because when we begin to hear things like that, we process that. And we process it sometimes. Our mind takes us to a place of fear. And there are things that we've gotten used to having and doing that we can't do or we don't have right now. And we begin to have this overwhelming thought that says, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? What should I do? How should I deal with this? And of course, when we have that thought and we see so many others begin to implement plans, we, we begin to weigh those plans as they come out. All you have to do is watch the TV and you'll be able to see, well, this is the plan for now and this is the plan for now. And someone will speak against that plan. And so there are lots of different plans. But in our minds, if, if we get to the point to where we say, well, we agree with that plan, then we say, okay, yes, this plan will make everything better. That's a hopeful thought we have, and we're good with that. But what we need to understand is that if we're completely honest, there's still no real assurance because all of us know that we have no control of the situation, and the underlying thought breeds fear. The underlying thought that we really don't have control. We can say we have a plan, but at the end of that plan, we say, I hope it works. It might work. It may work, but we have no assurance. So understand that even our hope of what we're trying to plan is based on, on uncertainty. And God, well, God is the only thing that is certain at this time. So I use this opportunity to be able to say that when we see things happening like we see, you can evidently see fear control people's, people's actions. Fear is a controller. When we watch and we see that even our stock market reacts to the confidence or fear that we have about certainty of a plan that may work or the news of something that's not working. When someone comes out and says, hey, this 
is this point of hope that we have right now. And you see economic markets rebound or you see the stocks rebound and then you see other news come out and you see, okay, well, it didn't come out when we needed it to and you see them fall. Understand, it's all a time of uncertainty, but it's based on the fact that everybody really knows no matter what we plan, we have no assurance of that. And this fear has changed a lot of things in the past couple of weeks. We're all focusing on the the negative impacts, but there are also some great things that are happening. And these things that are happening are certain hopes that are happening. And I want to share some of these with you. I want you to know that right now, because of this, because as we talked about Sunday, because that people have been shaken where they're at, there was a call that came to them and came to them, but because now something in their life has been shaken, people are rededicating their lives to the Lord. Sunday afternoon, as, as our service went out for Sunday morning, and I talked to different people who in their homes had, had heard the word of God and rededicated their lives to God, and, and they were closer to God. They were seeing what they needed to do as a, as a parent, as a wife, as a husband, as a child, as a co-worker. You know, we have to look at these things and say, we have eternal things that are changing now. There have been people that have observed where they are with the Lord because of this. Otherwise, they would have been distracted. And they've been going along in life distracted, but because of this, in the sense of immediacy, they've observed where they are with the Lord, and they have made decisions based on the fact that, hey, what is... What is really real in this life? What is really certain? And when they hear the word of God, they've actually accepted the Lord Jesus as their heart. I've had the opportunity to see people saved during this. And so when you see eternal things changing, you have to realize there's a hope even in this. And this wouldn't happen unless people's minds were changed in such a way. But I think at the point when we realize that we're not as smart as we thought we were, we're not as capable as we thought we were, You're going to see people turning to God because in a time of uncertainty, he's a God of certainty. And so I want to talk about a phrase today that that just stuck in my mind. And I found myself saying it to people as I was counseling them. And so it stuck and it stuck. And I think the importance of us being able to overcome the fear that we have right now, not to get to an arrogant fear, but to overcome an everyday fear where we're continually going back to fear. We're living in that fear. The importance is is our relationship with God. And when I say our relationship with God, we hear that phrase all the time, our relationship with God. So what do we mean when we say our relationship with God? I'm talking about a relationship with God that is a love relationship with God. Not a relationship of knowing there is a God, but a relationship of being in an intimate relationship with God where he is loving you, you're receiving it, and you're loving him back. And you say, well, most people know, and this is the catchphrase, is that God loves you. And we have passages of Scripture from John 3, 16 that everyone knows that says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And we forget that within that simple verse, there is a relationship that's shown. A relationship that says God loves you for God so loved you that he gave. So he sacrificially gave you something. What did he give you? He gave you a way to receive his love and come into a relationship with you. He gave you Jesus Christ, his son. Now understand that we can't come to God because sin stops us from coming to God. So he gave his son, Jesus Christ, who lived on this earth and never sinned so that he could sacrifice his life. And God had to watch him. God had to feel him sacrifice himself. God had to watch his his son Jesus go through this. Why? Because he loved us. And he wanted us to come into relationship with him. So we have to use that. We have to use what God did. And ask Jesus to use his sacrifice to forgive our sins so that we can come into a relationship with God. So understand what I just said. God, God loved us. If we accept his gift of love, his plea for us to come into a relationship with him, knowing he he loves us, he wants fellowship with us, but we can't come because of our sins. So God said, I'll make a way for you to come. I'll send my son. Now, next part of the relationship, we have to receive it. So if we receive it, then we have accepted his gift of love. And then 
Our position then is to do what? It's to love him back. You see, you can't have a relationship if it's just one person that's giving in the relationship. A relationship consists of two people who are giving into it. So that if we believe, that means we've accepted it as belief. So we come into a relationship with him and then he turns around and says, because you believe and you've accepted my love and you've given me love back, then I'm going to continue to give you. So it's a continual, I'm giving, he's giving, I'm giving, he's giving. That's relationship. That's a love relationship. It's the same way that it is in marriage. It's the same way that it is in friendship. No relationship is good unless there are two people giving. And in a love relationship, it cannot work if there's one person giving. So our security during this time is our love relationship with God, not just our relationship with God. Bear in mind, there are many people that say, I believe there's a God, and I've always believed there's a God. But that doesn't bring them into a relationship with God because God is there and they know him, but there is no love back and forth between them. God can give his love and has given his love. And Romans 5, 8 tells us that God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. So he gave that love to everyone, but everyone will not receive it. So everyone does not come into a relationship with God. I hope that's clear. So every one of us have an opportunity to come into a relationship with God, meaning that if we accept the love of God and we love him back, then we have that opportunity. But what I want you to understand with God about this love relationship with God is that When we're going through such a time as we are now, a time of fear, that the the most important thing that I can tell you right now is the thing that you battle fear with, the thing that you can get rid of fear, the thing that can cast out fear from you is your love relationship with God. Say it with me. My love relationship with God. I want you to understand that because it sounds so generic when we just talk about a relationship with God. But I want you to understand the Bible is going to show us that our love relationship with God is the key thing that we need to focus on now. Our love relationship with God is a difference in us having confidence right now or having doubts. It's the difference between us being able to be in a state of peace or a state of worry. And I want to give you an example before we start our scripture. The night before last, maybe several nights ago, two nights ago, I had the opportunity to speak with a young lady, 19 years old. She called me at home. And I noticed something that was significant. When she called me, she introduced herself to me. And because of what's going on now with the virus, she was was distraught. She had began to consider her own mortality. But she also began to consider her life and all these things that were just temporary things. And for the first time... God had actually shaken her world to where she had to think about things that a 19-year-old is just not normally thinking about. I mean, you're thinking about the life in front of you. You're thinking about all these different things and your mind goes here and there. As a matter of fact, you can understand that if you're 19, you're looking forward to what is to come and you're looking forward to what you can do and it's an active time in your life, but something happened. All she was concerned about was where she was with God because the thought hit her that her relationship with God was not real. She knew a God. She actually believed in God. But she could not say that she was confident that she had given her heart to God. She she couldn't say that she was confident that she was in a relationship with God. And as I asked her questions about this, she said, well, you know, I I don't worship like I should. I do other things. I come to God every now and then, but I definitely don't have him as a priority in my life. And, you know, I can't say with a surety that I know I would go to heaven, but I I do believe in him. But that's what was making her so upset. As we began to talk, I shared the gospel with her. I let her know that God loved her and what he'd done for her. But also in being able to, to tell her that God wanted that love relationship with her. That the reason that, that he made her was for her to have fellowship with him. To make a long story short, if it isn't too late, this 19-year-old girl who was in fear, who was crying and she would have to catch her breath because she was so distraught, she accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as her Savior. She prayed sincerely and asked God to come into her heart. She asked Him to use the blood of Jesus to forgive her sins. She cried out to God and 
confessed to God that she was a sinner. She believed who God was. She believed who Jesus was and that she could come to God through him. Before we started talking, I asked her point blank, do you, do you have any confidence now in your relationship with God? Can you tell me that you know that you're saved? And she says, I absolutely can't. She was distraught. She was crying and immediately. When we were through praying together, I asked her, I said, do you, do you know now beyond a shadow of a doubt that you've accepted the Lord as your Savior? Immediately. She laughed twice. Now, this girl had been crying throughout the whole conversation just because of, of being distraught, of knowing she was in a bad position. When she knew she had accepted the Lord Jesus Christ with confidence, there were two little laughs that came out. Still, you could tell that she was uh, emotional, but the laughs came out. And such a confidence that said, yes, I know. I mean, there's nothing that stops. Now, I just came into a relationship with God. So her fear, her fear completely went out of her. No more was there any fear that I'm disconnected with God. Because as of that time, she came into a relationship with God. And I want you to use that in your mind to be able to understand what he's telling us in the book of 1 John. In the book of, book of 1 John, we read a couple of verses here. Verse 18 and 19. And I want you to see how important these are. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 18 and 19, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Verse 19, we love him because he first loved us. So I want you to hold on to that and hold on to this phrase here that we hear in this verse that says, perfect fear casteth out love. All right, perfect love casteth out fear. Now, we know that fear right now is, is actually the pandemic that is spreading faster than the virus. And by rights, we all naturally fear that. But fear can be cast out. That means fear can be taken out of us by, as it says here, perfect love. Now, we learned last week we can't stop our natural mind from seeing and processing thoughts that might bring us to fear. But we also learn we don't have to stay in that state of fear. In 1 John 4, we see that God's talking about a love relationship that's complete and that you have been giving love, you've received love, and then you've given love back. That's what he means, perfect, complete. In the sense of the word perfect here, he's talking about a completion. Everything is in place. Now, let's talk about our relationships with each other. Our relationships, our love relationships require for someone to give love, for someone to receive love, and for someone to give love back. At that, the love relationship becomes what? Complete. And that's the perfectness that he's talking about here. And that's what, that's what John's telling us here. If we have a complete love where God is giving us love, we're receiving it, and we're giving love back then we are practicing perfect love. Now, why is this so important? Because what this thing has revealed is that there are a lot of people that are in a relationship with God, but they're not in a perfect love relationship with God. Now, get what I'm saying. They're fine to be able to be in a relationship with God from a distance. They're fine to be able to give God what they can, but it's not perfect love. They're counting on the fact that God has given this and God has given this and God has given this, but we barely give what we can back to God. So the relationship is not complete. There's not a giving, a receiving, and a giving back. And in essence, our whole Christian life, and I'm speaking to Christians, our Christian life should be lived by the motto of loving God back. That's your only job. Now, it might be done in many different ways, but you could put it all in the, this one category, is loving God back. His love is certain. It's sure. It comes to us, but our responsibility is to love God back. Now, it's huge because the measure that God uses to judge all of mankind, if you think about it, the judgment that it's spoken of, as man stands before God, at the end of your life, at the end of my life, at the end of every person's life, the, the basis that we will be judged on is whether we have received God's love 
and whether we have loved God back. Now think about this. Even the white throne judgment where sinners stand, people that have never accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior, they're based on the fact that they never entered into a love relationship with God. Did God love them? Yes. He loved the whole world. Did God love them enough to send Jesus for them? Yes, He commended His love toward us in that while we were sinners, He died for us. Yes, He loved them, but they never received the love. Much less gave it back. They never received it. They never accepted it. When we talk about receiving Jesus Christ as our Savior, accepting Jesus Christ, that's accepting the love. But then Christian, we also stand in judgment at the judgment seat of Christ. What will we be judged on? The same basis. Not that we didn't receive it, because if you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you received the love of God. But did you turn around and reciprocate love? Did you love Him back? Your actions are the way that you'll love Him back. So, I want you to understand the importance of just this phrase, perfect love. It means complete love. It means completing the cycle. God loving us, us accepting the love, and us loving Him back. So, with this being said, you'll see that this fourth chapter, John talks about love a lot. He begins in verse 7, and he commands us to love one another. He goes to verse 8, and he clearly says, God is love. So if we're representing him, we need to show the same kind of love that he gave to us to other people. I want you to read with me as I read these verses, beginning in verse 7 of John, 1 John chapter 4. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. Herein is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us, and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he hath given us his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Do you hear how many times he's saying love and God? Now listen to verse 17. Herein is our love made perfect, complete, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. Herein is our love made complete, meaning in the day of judgment we can have a confidence we don't have to fear even our judgment if we have exemplified and went through the perfect love relationship. And when I'm saying the perfect love relationship, don't get your mind to the point of saying, well, I haven't been perfect. He's talking about the complete love relationship. Nobody has been perfect. He said in verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. John is going above and beyond to say, notice what happens in a love relationship. We forget as we're living this life, even as Christians, that we're carrying out a love relationship. It's not about uh, being able to serve God because we have to. It's about serving God because we get to. It's about doing something back that would be able to honor Him for the same thing that He's done to us. It's about giving back. Verse 12 the Bible says, since no one actually sees God, God uses us to love each other so God can see, so they can see God in us. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us and his love is perfected in us. His love is complete in us. What is he trying to say? Since no one has seen God, they see God in us. The only time that somebody's going to recognize the love of God is when it's on display. And in verse 10, he, he tells us this is love. God initiates the love relationship. I want you to understand that when you have a verse in the Bible that points out something as powerful as this, and we see that herein is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us, God's trying to say that 
I initiated love. Now, it's up to you, up to you to complete it. See, God is faithful. God's always going to do His part. Our part came into play, and I'm going backwards in verses here so that you can understand. Our part came into play when God put it out there for us to receive. Look at verse 9. In this was manifested the love of God toward us. In what? Because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. So God made the first move. He made the first move in the love relationship, and it all comes down to what move we're making. And what I do believe is what, what's happening because of the, the fear even among Christians is that we're recognizing our love relationship is not where it needs to be. We're not in a complete love relationship with God. Now think about it. Think about the importance of this as Jesus even spoke in verses in Matthew chapter 22. Think about what he said, and, and you know this, this is familiar to you, but when Jesus was quizzed and someone was trying to trap him in a statement, and they were asking him, which commandment is the greatest commandment? Jesus said, Matthew 22, verse 37 through 40, he said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, all thy mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. What is he saying? He's saying that you were called first and foremost. Your first commandment is to love the Lord your God. He gave his love. You're called to receive it and love him back. And then you're called to spread his love. To be the love that is manifest in you to someone else. Our complete love relationship with God is the key to us casting out any fear that we have. Why? Because if we know we're in a love relationship with God, then there's no fear that this thing happening to us is God's way of judging us for a wrong position with Him. Now, is this thing happening to our world because of their lack of response to God and for them being able to push God aside? Well, of course these kind of things happen to get our mind back where it needs to be. But for us, do we need to fear what's going to happen with us? God is saying, you don't need to fear if you know that the person that is loving you, that's in a love relationship with you, is never going to have something that's going to harm you. No matter if you go through a sickness, it's not going to harm you. You see, God's eternally protected us. And His complete love relationship is the strength that we have to go on. And we can look back in the Old Testament. We can see examples from the Old Testament. God put this on display. He was able to show us, even in the Old Testament, if you go back to the book of Deuteronomy, which I'm going to ask you to go back to, We'll read certain things that God made evident. And, and when we look back at the Old Testament, we're able to see God's mind. He was speaking to the children of Israel, His chosen people, and no child of God. If you've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, you're considered that child of God even today. You come under that same promise that God gave. So understand something. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, we can see, as we look at this passage, we can see that God was telling the children of Israel that He wanted to bless them. He wanted them to live in confidence. He didn't want them to live in fear. He wanted them to live in the confidence that He loved them and they had nothing to worry about because He would be handling everything for them. If they love Him and they teach their children to love Him, they didn't need to fear. And so we have this passage back in Deuteronomy chapter 6 where all the people were assembled. And we read in verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart. So this is a declaration that was sent out to the children of Israel. And what was the first thing? Thou shalt what? Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. The relationship, the love relationship is paramount. But it's always been paramount. And he says thou shalt teach your children diligently. You should talk to them. When you sit with them, when you walk with them, when you lie down, when you get up, you should make sure that they're understanding. Understanding what? Understanding what's involved in the love relationship with God. That you have to reciprocate love, that you have to love Him back. And understand, as we continue to read in Deuteronomy, you will see that God told them, I didn't have to love you, but I love you. So it's an act of grace, it's an act of mercy. You've broken my heart, you've done things against me, but I still love you. 
And then I think this is key, and I, I don't want to miss this, because I think every now and then you find a verse that sums up quite a few other verses. So mark this on your notes. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12. Deuteronomy 10, verse 12. The Bible says, and now Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee? What a huge question. What does God want from you? In a love relationship, what does God want with you? He wants you to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all of his ways, and to love him and serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. To fear him does not mean to be afraid. It means a reverent fear where, yes, you respect his power, but you reverence him as the one and only true living God. There is no other gods. He wants you to walk in his ways. What does that mean? He wants you to be obedient to what he said is right. He wants you to love him. He wants you to serve him. He wants you to be able to give back into this relationship. And do you know that God tells them in these chapters in between, if you do this, I'm going to bless you. You don't have to worry about anything. I'm going to go in front of you wherever you go, and I'm going to, I'm going to be able to, to uh, battle your enemies. I'm going to make sure there's protection around you. I'm going to make sure you have provision. I'm going to make sure you have companionship. I am your God, and you are my people, and you are my children, and I will take care of you. What a comforting thing. Is there any fear in knowing the one that controls everything is taking care of me? There's no fear in that if you believe it. But he said, if you turn away from me, and you start to serve other gods. I'm going to tell you what's going to happen to you. And it doesn't mean a particular thing would happen, like a, a virus come or a pestilence come or a drought come or, or an army come or war. It means I'm going to tell you the worst thing that's going to happen. Your mind is going to go to a place of fear and stay there. Now, this is pretty neat. If you flip on over to the 28th chapter of Deuteronomy, I'm just trying to give you this in a succinct little capsule here so that you can see. He told them this in verses 66 and 67. This is Deuteronomy. If you don't, if you don't do the things that prove your love relationship with me, he said in verse 66 and 67, and thy life shall hang in doubt before thee. And thou shalt fear day and night and shall have none assurance of thy life. Isn't that exactly what we see the world in today? Isn't that exactly what we see individuals in? It's not so much people that are saying, I'm positive. It's people that are positively living in fear. People that are living in doubt. People that don't know which way to turn. It says, thou shalt fear day and night and have no assurance of thy life. There's no confidence that people have. They're so fragile at this point. It says, in the morning thou shalt say, would God that it were evening. In the evening you'll say, hey, I wish it were morning. Why? For the fear of thy heart wherewith thou shalt fear and the sight of thy eyes which you shall see. This is huge, guys. Deuteronomy 28, 66 and 67 God said, if you refuse to obey me, the biggest thing that will come after you is the innate fear that you will live with. You will say when it's night, I wish it was morning. When you'll say when it's morning, I wish it was night, you'll wish the day away, hoping this thing just goes away, but you'll live with no assurance of your life. What a terrible place to be. And God said, if you're in a love relationship with me, you don't have to live in that place. Glory to God. Today we see people who are living in this same lack of assurance. But understand, they didn't realize they were living in this lack of assurance until something like this came. They had a false assurance. Why? Because in the love relationship they had with God, they were being given love. Even Christians who had received love, they weren't giving anything back, but it wasn't clear to them because nothing challenged their safety. And when nothing challenges our safety then we don't think we have to run to anywhere. We don't think about who we have to run to. We begin to think in our own self, we can take care of ourselves. Do you know what that means? That means you, you think you become self-sufficient. It causes us to be selfish. Anybody that's selfish and is involved in a love relationship, it doesn't work. The love relationship doesn't work. If we live in the confidence of perfect love, 
The Bible says it will cast out fear. This is big now. Perfect love cast out fear. Say it with me. Perfect love cast out fear. What are you saying? If your love relationship with God is complete, it'll cast this fear out of the way. Complete love is when love is not just stated as our position. It's when our position is lived out in our action. Perfect love is not when love is just stated as our position. It's when our position is lived out in our action. You know, John spoke a lot about this in, in the book of 1 John. He said, if you love God, but don't live out your love, then it's not perfect love. Your love relationship with God is not complete. How many people, and don't raise your hand today, but how many people are realizing, hey, I probably am not living in a complete love relationship with God. There are people at different areas. that Maybe there's some people that have never accepted or received that love. You're definitely not in a love relationship with God. He's put it out there, but you haven't received it. There are people that have received it, Christians, that are realizing, I received it, but I'm not giving back what I need to give back to. And it wouldn't have been apparent to you until you got to this place of having to test your perfect love. In any kind of relationship, when that relationship between husband and wife is tested, do you know what's tested? Perfect love. If your love is complete. If there are two unselfish people giving back and forth to each other. The love that I have for my wife, that love's not just based on me saying I love her. It's based on the actions of love that I have when I'm around her and when I'm not around her. You see, it's not just what I say, it's what I do. I want you to understand that if I don't have actions of love when I'm not around her, then I'm not in the love relationship that I need to be. There's pretty, there's pretty um, much evidence to say that when I'm around her, I'm going to show her love. I'm going to say, I love you. I'm going to act like I love you. But that's not the real test of our love. The test of our love is when I'm not around her. You see, the, the evidence tells me she's standing right in front of me, so I want to do this. But when I leave and I'm not around her, I have to prove my love then more than I have to do when I'm around her. So my words can say it when I'm around her, but my actions really prove it when I'm not around her. And the same way it is with God. A lot of times we find ourselves in a position to where the love that we have for God, we come into his presence and we assemble and we worship and we say we have a love that's perfect, a love that's complete. But understand, our love is not complete because when we come together, we, we sing to Him and we praise Him and we read His Word. That's not complete love. Complete love is what we do when we're not around Him, when we're not in His presence together. I have to ask myself, would my love relationship to God be as evident when I'm not around other people in worship as it is when I am around other people in worship? Because that's when... Perfect love is on display. You know, if we're complete in expressing our love to Him, then you realize we don't have anything to fear because we're displaying complete love. What we fail to realize is that God's always with us. He's seeing if our life outside of church is proving our love to Him. God loves us all the time, but He ultimately is judging us by our actions of loving Him back, even when we're not formally assembled together worshiping. If we're displaying that kind of complete love, then you're displaying it outside of here? Do you know that right now there's a fear that might come into your mind when you hear a newscast? There's a fear that might come into your mind when you hear of something that disrupting something as far as economy or something there. But do you realize that the next thought that comes is the prevailing thought that I'm in a love relationship with God. He has promised me he'll never leave me. He'll never forsake me. He has promised me that he will walk through this. And David, as David said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. 
He's talking about the love relationship he had with God. He's saying that as soon as that thought comes of fear, we can cast it out. Why? Because our love relationship is where it needs to be. It's complete. This is a call to get our love relationship back where it needs to be with God. And it wouldn't happen unless it were challenged. And right now it's being challenged. And the reason that fear is staying with all of us is because it's not where it needs to be. Perfect love means that we're loving Him back. And the other thing that I want you to realize is perfect love, complete love, is also when the love of God comes to us and then is transferred through to someone else. You know, when we read that first part of 1 John chapter 4, and we read, that, beloved, it's, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us and his love is perfect in us. That's verse 11 and 12. Understand, perfect love is a love that comes full circle. Now remember this, perfect love is a love that comes full circle. And we saw that as we described the first part. He loves us. You say it with me. We accept the love. We receive it. Then what do we do? We love him what? Love him back. That's full circle love. But that's in our relationship with him. Part of our love relationship is that somewhere in the middle of that, that love that God has given us is not just given to us and it's just a, a one-on-one -on -one thing with us and God. We're bringing other people into that relationship. Love has to come full circle. So what do I mean? God shows it to us. We show his love to someone else. They receive his love and then they begin to love him by loving him back by their actions and they share that love with someone else and they receive his love and begin to show their love back to him. All the while, we've received his love and are drawing closer to God in our love relationship because we're seeing the circle of love carried out and we're a part of it how many of us can say hey we know we can look back in the last week in the last months in the last year of our life we are a constant part of god's circle of love going out to somebody and seeing that person come to god amen or oh me because god's got you as, as a part of the circle of love that perfect love that's complete in its purpose once it goes out, it's now casting out fear and doubt of a group of people instead of just you because they're basing their provision, their protection, their peace on the love that God's shown them. Do you get what I'm saying? Can I tell you what kind of problem we have right now? You can sit and listen to the news and you can say, if we do this, it'll help with the problem. Here's the medical side of it. Here's what we can do to help medically. And then you see, well, here's the economic side and here's what we can do to help economically. This person has a plan and they go out there and I've listened to it and you listen to it. Here's the problem. We need a spiritual fix. The problem is, we need to come full circle and, and get back to a love relationship with God. That love relationship used to be something that was put out on a platform. It was talked about openly in the schools. It was talked about in homes. Church was the place to go to hear the word of God. There were people that were bold in saying it. And I realized even several nights before and listening to something that was on TV, I was listening to a debate and during the debate, there was actually a commercial with someone that came on in that commercial and boldly said, I want you to help support this, this uh, freedom here of not having to hear about God. And they ended that by being able to say, on TV, on a commercial, I saw it twice, boldly saying, I'm an atheist and I'm not afraid to burn in hell. That was put out on TV. It was paid for. People ran it. People watched it. Watch boldness. And you think, oh, I can't believe that was put out there. Understand this. We have an opportunity to put the opposite out every day in our love relationship with God. And that love relationship, I'm not going to let anybody talk about my wife. What am I going to do? I'm going to defend that position. I'm going to keep pouring into that. In our love relationship with God, we're going to defend that position. Not in a rude, not in an arrogant manner. Then what kind of manner, Mike? in a manner of love, in a, in a manner of being able to say, I'm loving him back and look at the peace that I have. I'm respecting this thing that's going on and I'm doing my due diligence 
Because I have wisdom enough to know that I'm not going to walk out in a lightning storm and say I'm God's special kind of person and so since I don't want to get struck, He's not going to strike me. No, I'm not going in that kind of arrogance. I'm going in a sense of love and saying, I'm in a love relationship with God. He's got me. He's got whatever's going to happen to me. He's got my economic. He's got my physical. I never have had it. And so I recognize that. And so I have a peace. It casts out the fear. Would you like to have some of that? And that's, that's what I'm saying. You're able to spread the love of God, to, to let them know that God loves you enough to where he made sacrifice for you. It's more than just this physical world. This physical world is uncertain. So that's the message that we have to get out. If we really believe in God's sovereign power and control over everything, if we're living in that love, meaning that we've received it, and that our actions are actions of loving Him back, then there will be a confidence that we can live with instead of living in fear and in doubt. If you go back a, a page here, I know our text is 1 John chapter 4. I want you to understand that sometimes God just gives us a, a little tidbit that we can see, and I want to read you just the way God's trying to speak to us and 1 John chapter 3, it's just a page back. He says, verse 18, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. What is he saying? Don't just say it. Live it. I want sincere love in this love relationship. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. Don't miss that. We'll assure. We have assurance. Now, is there any assurance in fear? No. We'll have assurance, so we have that word, assure our hearts before Him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. What is he saying? Right now, John is telling, I want you to grade your love relationship. And if you still have fear, you don't have assurance. You see, assurance is knowing that if God looks at me, He can't judge our love relationship as bad. You say, well, listen, I'm in a state right now where he's judging it as bad. Well, you know what he tells you to do? He says that if you come to him and confess to him that and repent of him, that he'll forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. And grace gives you an opportunity to reinvest in that love relationship, to rededicate yourself to that love relationship. You know, I've told my wife I've loved her here for a lot of years. But every now and then I come to her because I've done something that doesn't act like I love her. And I have to say what? I'm sorry. And if she wants the love relationship to go on, then she'll accept that I'm sorry. But it's not a, a word, I'm sorry. It's a sincere, I'm sorry. And God's the same way. It's just that he can look at our heart. And this is what this passage is telling us. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart. Knowing that God knows all things, God can see our heart. So I want you to understand if we're really in a heartfelt love relationship with God, we will have confidence. Look at verse 21. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. You see, you can't have confidence and fear at the same time. See, we get distracted in life and we begin to love the things that are of the world, meaning our, our true affections are on things that have nothing to do with God, meaning our true affections are displayed in our actions to pursue other things instead of God. How many of us can say that? We know we're in a love relationship with God, but if He were to look at our actions, we're really pursuing something more than we're pursuing Him. To boil this down, complete love or perfect love is when we prioritize our love relationship with God. So we know we've learned we have to love God back. And we know we've learned that we have to love others. It's the circle of love. But the third thing I want you to know in our love relationship with God, we have to prioritize that love. Perfect love, complete love is when we prioritize our love relationship with God. We put Him first. When we're in a love relationship with God, that doesn't put Him behind all these other things in life that we really want to have. We prioritize our love relationship with God. Then, then we put Him in front all these other things, they're not wrong to have a lot of these other things, but when we put them in front of God, then what we've done is we've hurt our love relationship with Him. Then we begin to trust these things. Do you know why everyone is completely distraught about the economic situation we're in? You say, well, hey, dummy, it's because we need, we need money to live. Well, we need money to live, but nobody, nobody 
has, has went to this dire situation in a week or two weeks to where they have just been uh, put in a situation to where they cannot, they cannot find food. It's nowhere. There's nowhere giving it. To them. Nobody is there yet. But you know what it is? It's the thought. It's the fear of what is to come. Because we as a, as a people, as a country, as a world, have begun to worship that. It has become what we put first. Our pleasure that got taken away, our, 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 all of our activities that we were doing that we put in front of God, they've been taken away. So we get to a place of understanding here that, that maybe we didn't prioritize our love relationship with God. Do you know that if we prioritize our love relationship with God, it will cast out fear. We will be able to say, we're in a position, God, look at us. You know what I'm thinking about you. You know I completely trust you. I trust your sovereign power. I trust who you are. I know these things are happening, but my first love is not money anymore. My first love is not my possessions. My first love is not my name or, or, or the, the prideful heart of the selfish things I want. My love relationship is based on what you want for me, and I know you'll end up giving me some of those things, but we've lost track. It's easy to see we've lost track. All of us have. So what I want you to see is, that perfect love of prioritizing him will cast out fear because we'll know that we're doing our part in the love relationship. You see, God will always do his part. And I think there's something we don't talk about. The reason that our, as Christians, our securities, insecurities come, our, our fears come is because there's a part of us that know what we're not doing in our relationship with him. Don't you have that part? And when something like this comes, we begin to judge how God's going to do his part based on how we've been doing our part. And I think that's the wake-up call. And it should be. You say, well, it, it makes me fear. Well, it should only make you fear long enough to turn to God and rework your love relationship with him. You see, that's the key. What do you mean the key? As we said to begin with, your love relationship with God is the key to casting out this fear. It's not an arrogance that says God will protect me in whatever I do. It's a confidence that God's going to keep pouring His love. Pouring His love on me because we're in a complete, perfect love relationship. Do you realize that when I made a covenant to my wife, I said for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, sickness and health. That means no matter if the situation changes, this love relationship stays intact. What will I give? Well, I said until death do us part. That meant that I was willing to give everything. That was a love relationship that I invested in, that I proclaimed. You know, when you accept the Lord Jesus Christ, you come into a love relationship that is a stronger covenant. It's a covenant that passes this world. It's a covenant that extends for eternity. Do you realize how many times that we're not doing our part in that covenant love relationship? And when we realize that, and we realize that he is in control and we're not, it should bring us to a reverent fear of where am I with God? And I hope that's where we're at today. And I'm not saying this to bring you down. I'm saying it to bring you up because there are people everywhere that are coming to this. And as I told you, people are rededicating their life to the Lord. People are getting saved. Why? Because they're coming to the relationship. They're coming to the part of, of evaluating or reevaluating their love relationship with God. And that's all I'm asking you to do is reevaluate today your love relationship with God, and see if God would consider it to be a relationship that is complete. Is it perfect love? Well, you know, he's doing his part, but it's up to us to whether it's perfect or it's complete. Are we loving him back, first of all? Do we receive it and love him back? If you've never accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you haven't received it. You're not in a love relationship. God loved, but it has to be received. Once you receive him, you're in that love relationship. And then what is your part? To love him back. That's a complete love relationship. And then once you're in that, you're bringing other people into that relationship the same way that as a, as a husband and wife, we brought our family into that relationship. You bring others into the relationship that you have with God. He tells you to love others because that's the way he manifests his love to other people. And thirdly, we constantly need to evaluate our love relationship with God because it's so easy for him 
to lose priority. We learn in 1 John chapter 2, and I'll close with this. We haven't listened to this, and because of this, it's our love relationship is hurt with God. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. We, we have a love relationship with God in which God can step out of the priority role whenever we begin to love other things more than Him. Christian, take notice of this. And know that if you want to cast out fear, it all depends on your love relationship with God. Unbeliever, skeptic that's listening. I want to remind you of that young lady that came to me in fear, that came to me with no confidence, with no assurance. Once she accepted the love of God, knowing that, that he was handling everything, that she was in his hands, that she was his child, what happened was the Holy Spirit came into her. And this is what happens to believers. The Holy Spirit comes into you and it strengthens you in times like this. Paul told us in Romans 8 that you were not given the spirit of bondage again to fear. You were given the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. He was talking to children of God. You weren't given a spirit of bondage to fear. You were given the spirit of adoption. I've got you. You're my child. I will prove my love to you. I will walk, walk you through all these situations. I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll always be here for you. I'm in complete control. That's a, that's a love that casts out fear. But if your position is in a position where you're not completing that love, you're not loving him back, you're not letting that love go out to others, and you're not prioritizing that love, then you're not living in perfect love. There's no way your fear is going to be cast out at this time. Does that make sense? I hope it does. I pray that God uses it to let you evaluate your love relationship with God right now and do something right now to change it. During this time of invitation, you have an opportunity to just reveal yourself to God. You're in a relationship with Him. Reveal yourself to God and say, God, this scripture found me where I'm at today. I want to rededicate my, my life to our relationship. I love you, and I haven't shown you like I need to. Maybe it's been words, but I want to rededicate myself to you. I want to rededicate my life. I want our love relationship to cast out all the fears because, listen, right now, I can see that I put other things in front of you. Pray that prayer, whatever it is, whatever the situation, pray it. And if you're listening and you've never accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, He loves you. He loves you so much. He's made every provision for you to come to Him. You can accept that love and come into a relationship with Him by confessing you're a sinner, asking Him to forgive your sins, asking Him to bring you into that love relationship, claiming Him as your God and knowing that you're going to live for Him, asking Jesus to be your Savior, and you receive it, and you begin to love Him back. You can do that at this point in time. Pray with me. Father God, I love you and I praise you and I thank you for your precious word. I thank you, God, as it speaks to us today and I pray that you would take the message. You would use it, Lord, to draw your children closer to you. Lord, to cast out fear everywhere. Lord, wherever this broadcast goes out, cast out fear by using this complete, perfect love that we can have in our relationship with you. Use it, Lord, to draw people to you that are not saved and let them see your hand is out, Lord, wanting to have a relationship with them. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you. I, I appreciate so much you being with us today, tuning in. I pray that God spoke to you. I look forward to the next time. If the Lord, Lord tarries, if he doesn't come back before Sunday, we'll be coming to you again. I invite you to gather your family together at that time and worship at 1030 on Sunday morning, and uh, we'll hear what God has to say to us. Thank you so much.